even the most casual passerby looking in this room would know that something's going on. And uh, when you see a room filled like this in a building shaped like this, it's generally something very good or something very sad. And this is something very good. Uh, we are accustomed to gathering in places of worship like this. And we're summoned weekly to the worship of the Lord Jesus Christ and the triune God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. We, we are accustomed to gathering in rooms like this when there is the going home of a saint. When we gather together, there is a, there's a custom of meeting in a room like this for just what is taking place this day, which is the commencement of the Boyce College class of 2016. This is indeed the day the Lord has made, and we're rejoicing in it, and this is the kind of day that is defined by rejoicing. That, that's why we have gathered here. This is a very happy occasion. This is the way seriously scholarly people throw a party. <laughs> yeah, the, to us, this is a blast. This is fun. This is what we get to do at the end of the academic term. This is a costume party, and it is a, it is a great gathering. Most of the people who would look at the regalia today would recognize something seriously scholarly and academic is going on here. Most of them have no clue what all of this means. But the gowns that are worn by these graduates are an indication is recognized through centuries of scholarship in colleges and universities and similar schools that they are now formally and in terms of commemoration entering into a new period of life behind them a very serious accomplishment. The gowns they wear to mark their graduation are to indicate something that has been accomplished and a status that has now been achieved, a, a learning that has been received. And we will commemorate that in a very recognizable way as we hand diplomas to these students and as we confer degrees upon them. And in terms of American cultural and educational life, graduation from college leads to the question that every one of these graduates is repeatedly asked, well, what are you going to do now? Graduation from college is in our culture and society recognized as a key transition into the full responsibilities of adulthood. There are parents sitting here rejoicing in the absolute joy of the accomplishments of their children, and they are feeling richer today than at any point in their recent lives as they are contemplating the future. There are lots of people who are saying, well, what are you going to do now? We all recognize that. There is something really, really important going on here just in terms of the degrees to be conferred and the, the academic accomplishment to be recognized. But we also understand that something else is going on here, and we're celebrating that too. The period of life that is now coming to a ceremonial conclusion for these graduates is one of the most important in any human life. Those years of transition between high school and the full responsibilities of adulthood and the experience of being in college or university, the social experience, the relational experience, the, the, the experience in terms of growth not only in learning and scholarship and in academic issues, but far beyond the growth that takes place spiritually and relationally, the, the growth into maturity. Anyone who has gone through this process years later looks back and recognizes I was the same person when I graduated from college that I was when I graduated from high school, but at the same time, I was a different person when I graduated from college than when I graduated from high school. Life is lived year by year and day by day, but not all periods of life have the same impact on the remainder of life's trajectory. Part of the sense of moment of gathering together today is because we recognize these last four years, maybe for some, these last a little bit more than four years, <laughs> maybe for some a bit less than four years, but these four years have been determinative of the person, the man or the woman, the Christian, 
uh, these graduates are and will be. You have to understand from the perspective of a faculty what that means. Teaching is not merely the transfer of information. If that were so, then it could be more easily transferred. It would not require the investment relationally that takes place between teacher and student. There is far more going on here. The teachers who have taught these students at Boyce College are not merely scholars. They are not merely academics. They are also those who serve the church of the Lord Jesus Christ by influencing and shaping a generation, by investing in them. Teaching is a reciprocity. It's not a one-way equation, and a relationship emerges out of this. And that's why you have to understand that when faculty members and, and others get up and they, they read the texts in the ceremony of graduation and they pray the prayers in the ceremony of graduation, it's because they too are feeling the moment that you are feeling and these graduates are feeling. And so I speak on their behalf to say, we want all of you to know we have come not only to teach these students and to know these students, but to love these students. And thus we come to the end of these four years, and it is happy, but it is heavy, and just the way it should be, not only for a school, but especially for a Christian school. As I said, these students are being asked over and over again, so what's next? And most of them by now have something to say, and it varies. For some, it's immediately into the vocational world. For others, it is the continuation of study. For at least one who I greeted yesterday, it is entry into the armed forces. Many noble and good things will follow when we ask what comes next. For many, if not all, eventually some kind of job description will come next. Some description of a vocation, a profession, a, a job to be fulfilled, a role to be fulfilled. I want to suggest to you that I don't know exactly what that job description will be for these students, and amazingly enough, even those who think they know what they're going to be doing next month may not be doing that a decade from now. We do have confidence, however, that the education invested in them through Boyce College will prepare them, whatever the job description may be, as they move now into the future. But every one of us actually has a common job description, at least all believers in the Lord Jesus Christ is found in Scripture. And in that light, I would refer you to Romans chapter 12, and we'll begin reading at verse 3 of Romans chapter 12. Paul writes, for by the grace given to me, I say to everyone among you not to think of himself more highly than he ought to think, but to think with sober judgment, each according to the measure of faith that God has assigned. For as in one body we have many members, and the members do not all have the same function, so we, though many, are one body in Christ and individually members of one another. Having gifts that differ according to the grace given to us, let us use them. If prophecy in proportion to our faith, if service in our serving... The one who teaches in his teaching, the one who exhorts in his exhortation, the one who contributes in generosity, the one who leads with zeal, the one who does acts of mercy with cheerfulness. Paul continues, let love be genuine. Abhor what is evil, hold fast to what is good, love one another with brotherly affection. Outdo one another in showing honor. Do not be slothful in zeal, be fervent in spirit. Serve the Lord. Rejoice in hope. Be patient in tribulation. Be constant in prayer. Contribute to the needs of the saints and seek to show hospitality. Bless those who persecute you. Bless and do not curse them. Rejoice with those who rejoice. Weep with those who weep. Live in harmony with one another. Do not be haughty, but associate with the lowly. Never be wise in your own sight. Repay no one evil for evil, but give thought to do what is honorable in the sight of all. If possible, so far as it depends on you, live peaceably with all. Beloved, never avenge yourselves, but leave it to the wrath of God, for it is written, vengeance is mine, I will repay, says the Lord. To the contrary, if your enemy is hungry, feed him. If he is thirsty, give him something to drink. For so by doing, you will heap burning coals on his head. Do not be overcome by evil, 
but overcome evil with good. That is the job description of the believer in the Lord Jesus Christ. And it comes to us in the context of Romans chapter 12, as Paul in his letter to the church at Rome has made this great shift as he has been describing the gospel. And he has told us in the beginning that he is not ashamed of the gospel, for it is the power unto salvation for all who to believe, to the Jew first and also to the Greek. Because Paul has made very clear how the gospel actually was accomplished for us, as in Romans chapter 3, verses 21 and following, he, he demonstrates even as we were sinners and Christ died for us, God put Christ forward as a propitiation in order to demonstrate that he is both just and the justifier of the one who has faith in Jesus. Paul explains the gospel, telling us that all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God, and then pointing to the fact that God saves sinners through the substitutionary atonement accomplished by his Son. Then we have in the book of Romans those great therefores that frame our understanding and celebration of the gospel. Therefore, there is now no condemnation to the one who is in Christ. Paul makes the turn here in Romans chapter 12 towards a practical application of the Christian faith. The one who has come to know this new life in Christ, the sinner whose sins have been forgiven by the substitutionary atonement of Christ, the one who has been justified by faith, is to live a life that is described as Paul here writes to the church at Rome and by the inspiration of the Holy Spirit writes to the church wherever it is found until Jesus comes. Just in terms of the flow of biblical theology, one of the very interesting things here, especially in the second portion or paragraph of the text I read this morning, is that there is here almost a sequential parallel to what is found in the teaching of Jesus in the Sermon on the Mount, and in particular in the Beatitudes. And so here you have Paul speaking to the church, applying the teaching of Jesus in terms of a job description for Christians. And as we look to the passage, we begin in verse 3. We are told that Paul was given grace in order to tell us that none of us should think of himself more highly than he ought to think. It's a good word for us all. We are instead to think with sober judgment, each according to the measure of faith that God has assigned. Paul goes on to explain the, the body metaphor in the church. So as in one body, we have many members, and the members do not all have the same function. So we, though many, are one body in Christ and individually members one of another, having gifts that differ according to the grace given to us. So the graduates arrayed here before us represent several degree programs and, and several concentrations and majors. They're being prepared for several different, though very carefully defined roles and functions, serving the church and serving our society, serving the cause of Christ. And each has identified certain desires and, and, and a sense of call into a specific area of preparation in order to apply that in life. And, and, and each has certain gifts that are reflected here. But the point of Paul is that the church of the Lord Jesus Christ needs them all and needs us all. The church, the, the church that we see now in this generation needs this generation, this, this graduating class of Boys College, the class of 2016, in a demonstrable way. We need your gifts, and we need your calling, we need your conviction, and we need your conviction, and we need it in the church of the Lord Jesus Christ now. Your graduation from Boyce College is, is, is not a down payment in order that at some point in the future you might fulfill your function and calling in the church. This church needs you now. As urgently as Paul was writing to the church at Rome, I speak to you. This church the church of the Lord Jesus Christ in this generation needs the graduating class of Boys College of 2016 to show up ready for action now. And we can tell you and can testify to the fact that the Lord has greatly blessed this class with talents and callings and gifts. They are now called to be stewards of those gifts. You are now called to exercise those gifts and to be a good steward of all that has been invested in you in terms of learning and in terms of opportunity, in terms of experience, the, the love of your family and your parents channeled into you, the hopes and prayers of, of your church channeled and, and laid upon you, 
the degrees now to be conferred upon you and the hopes and dreams of those gathered in this place and all those beyond they represent, they are all at this moment summoning you to rise and stand and act and take your place in a long line of faithfulness to stand for the gospel of the Lord Jesus Christ and for the faith once for all delivered to the saints and to serve the cause of Christ right now. Moral exhortations follow even as Paul describes the gifts and their operation. Let the one who exhorts, exhort to the glory of God. Let the one who teaches, teach to the glory of God. Let the one who has this function, fulfill it to the glory of God and that function to the glory of God. But then in terms of the moral habits, the moral shape of the Christian life. As we know, Paul says, let love be genuine. Here's the job description. Abhor what is evil, hold fast to what is good. The interesting thing about this is that this could be said to any Christian of any generation, of any age, in any century. But imagine how urgent these words ring in the year 2016. Abhor what is evil, hold fast to what is good. Love one another with brotherly affection. Outdo one another in showing honor. Paul's language here is so striking because it's so amazingly candid. And, and, and it's not written in the kind of language that you hear so much modern exhortation, if you can call it exhortation at all. This is a lot more than be happy and be you and be fulfilled. This is substantial moral exhortation from the apostle. Outdo one another in showing honor. Do not be slothful in zeal. Be fervent in spirit. Serve the Lord. The apostle Paul understands that Christians are to be in motion. Christians are to be in movement. Christians are to be active. The faith is to be translated into life in order to serve the cause of Christ and take the gospel to the ends of the earth and build up the church and be of good in the society around us. In these moral exhortations, Paul continues by telling us we are to serve the Lord in rejoicing, in being patient in tribulation, constant in prayer, contributing to the needs of the saints. It's practical too, show hospitality. But we are speaking to the class of 2016, and as we have spoken of the urgency that is before us, even that urgency in abhorring what is evil and holding fast to what is good, we recognize we're entering a whole new age. And we sense this age changing around us, and we can feel the pressure of it, and we understand that this generation, the class of Boyce College of 2016, in terms of the larger culture, they are likely never to know an untroubled moment. Bless those, Paul writes, who persecute you. Bless and do not curse them. Rejoice with those who rejoice and weep with those who weep. Live in harmony with one another. It's amazing. Paul speaks of the relationships we have inside the church and then outside the church. Inside the church, he says, live in harmony with one another, and he makes that substantial. He, he tells us what that's to look like. We're not to think better of ourselves than we ought. We're to think better of others. We're to outdo one another in showing honor. But even outside the church, he's, he's clear in extending this insofar as that is possible. And he uses that very language, insofar as it is up to you, live peaceably with all. That's a good exhortation for the Boys College class of 2016. As far as you are able, live peaceably. Paul goes on even to describe what it means uh, to do so. Not only do we abhor what is evil and hold fast to what is good, and not only do we seek to be friendly to all and friend to all, do we seek to outdo one another in showing respect, do we seek even in larger society to live peaceably insofar as we are able. Paul goes on to say we're not even to repay evil with evil. And he doesn't stop there. He says it's not good enough not to repay evil with evil. We have to actually repay evil with good. And remember that a day of judgment is coming, but it is not ours. It is the Lord's. So my charge to the Boyce College class of 2016 is to understand that this is indeed your job description. You will have another one to be certain, written or unwritten, but the reality is you will not have one more important than this. 
And it is addressed not only to you, but to me and to everyone who is a follower of Christ gathered in this room. But you have to understand how easy it is today, or for that matter, how righteous it is today to speak directly to you. This is our last opportunity so to do. You are trapped in these pews. <laughs> you are dressed too conspicuously to leave unannounced. You are expected to cross this stage and take this degree and show it to your friends and loved ones. So we've got you right where we want you. <laughs> and what do I want you to hear? From a brother in Christ, the exhortation to show this world what it means to live out this faith and show it to the world in order that they will see Jesus and desire him. And show this faith in order that they will see you and wonder why it is that you have such hope, why it is that you are so kind, why it is that wherever you are found, good things happen. In so doing, you will serve the Lord Jesus Christ. You will bring honor upon this institution who rightly honors you today. And you will show all Christians how to fulfill this job description given to us all. Let's pray. Our Father, we are so thankful that we get to gather in this moment. We pray for these students. We pray for the lives they will touch and lead. And Father, we pray right now that your word will settle in our hearts, that your glory may be evident in us. We pray this in the name of Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen.